It's a pleasure and a privilege to be speaking to you today. You see here my affiliation with the University of Pennsylvania, as well as my disclosure that I'm a co-founder and advisor to Verve Therapeutics, a company focused on cardiovascular genome editing, which I'll mention in my presentation. Let me start by saying that even though this is a heart failure conference, I'm going to be talking more about coronary artery disease, because ischemic heart disease is a leading cause of heart failure. And the prevention of coronary artery disease no, no, Anand, not, would go a long uh, way is not, uh, towards preventing heart failure. Only. About a decade ago, when I was a postdoctoral fellow with the gentleman on the right, say Catharacin, at Massachusetts General Hospital and the Broad Institute, we wanted to take advantage of recent advances in human genetics to take a fresh approach to preventive cardiology. Our goal was to find genetic superheroes in the general population people with DNA variants with beneficial mutations that protect them from cardiovascular disease. This might give us clues as to novel ways to prevent disease in the rest of the population. We were inspired by the example of PCSK9. As many of you know, PCSK9 has become the basis of a whole new class of medications. The PCSK9 gene was discovered in 2003 Within a few years, it was discovered that people with a single mutation in the gene, with one copy of the gene turned off, had substantially lower levels of LDL cholesterol, as well as substantially reduced risk of coronary artery disease events. What really got people excited was the identification of a few individuals with two mutations, with both copies of the gene turned off. In other words, no functional PCSK9 protein at all. These individuals were healthy without any serious adverse consequences. This told us that PCSK9 would be an effective and safe therapeutic target. In 2015, just 12 years after the discovery of PCSK9, two monoclonal antibodies that bind PCSK9 protein in the bloodstream were approved for use in patients. Say Catharacin and I wanted to know whether there were more PCSK9s in the human genome waiting to be discovered. We scoured the literature to look for genetic superheroes, and we came upon a series of papers published in the 1990s and 2000s by Gus Schoenfeld at Washington University in St. Louis, a world expert lipidologist. The woman on the left, Anna Fuhrer, first came to Gus's attention when she was found to have an extremely low LDL cholesterol level as well as an extremely low triglyceride level. Gus recruited her and her family into a research study. It turned out that three of her siblings also had this unusual combination of very low LDL cholesterol and very low triglycerides, a condition we've come to call familial combined hypolipidemia. After years of effort, Gus was unable to identify the responsible gene. It was simply too challenging with the existing technology. Fast forward to 2009, when Saik and I were able to use a brand new technology, exome sequencing, on DNA samples from Anna's family to discover the responsible gene. The gene turns out to be angiopoietin-like 3, or ANGPTL3. Anna and her three affected siblings turned out to each have two different nonsense mutations in this gene. In other words, both copies of the gene were turned off, and they made no functional ANGPTL3 protein. Despite this, they were entirely healthy. Very similar to PCSK9, but potentially even better, since both LDL cholesterol and triglycerides were down. It took another seven years of work, but Saik and I and others were eventually able to show that the 1 in 300 people in the general population who have one copy of the ANGPTL3 gene turned off not only have lower LDL cholesterol and lower triglycerides, but also have substantially lower risk of coronary artery disease. We also have data from human genetics and from mice suggesting that there's also reduced risk of type 2 diabetes. A particular advantage of ANGPTL3 is that, like PCSK9, it's made in the liver and secreted into the bloodstream. There are now multiple ANGPTL3 inhibitors in development, a monoclonal antibody, an siRNA, and an antisense oligonucleotide. 
It's great that we have therapeutic targets like PCSK9 and ANG-PTL3, but there's still a general limitation with lipid-lowering therapies. All of them represent chronic therapies for a chronic disease process. For standard therapies like statins, azetamibe, and icosapentethyl, patients have to take anywhere from 1 to 8 pills every single day for the rest of their lives if they want the full protective effect. For biologics like the PCSK9 antibodies, they have to be injected every few weeks for the rest of one's life. Even the newest PCSK9 inhibitor, the siRNA drug called Incliseran, which is designed to stick around in the body for a long time and will only need to be taken once every six months, it will still need to be taken again and again for the rest of one's life. This means that adherence is a big issue. This is a recent article from my hometown newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, that featured Avery Watts, who at the time was 10 years old. She has such severe familial hypercholesterolemia that she requires several hours of apheresis every week to clean the LDL cholesterol out of her blood. Despite this aggressive therapy, she unfortunately had to undergo multiple open heart surgeries last year. This particular article asked the question of whether CRISPR gene editing could provide a new treatment for patients like Avery. So we've all heard about CRISPR, but you might not be familiar with the details of how it works. In the interest of time, I won't explain how CRISPR works here. Instead, I'll just say that standard CRISPR gene editing, as shown on the left, is like using a molecular scissors to cut through a gene. Base editing, as shown on the right, is like using a pencil and eraser. Erase one letter in the DNA and write in a new letter. Either standard CRISPR gene editing or base editing can be used to turn off a gene. Over the past several years, my laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania has been testing CRISPR gene editing and base editing of genes like PCSK9 and ANG-PTL3 and other liver genes in various mouse models. To make a long story short, we have it working extremely well. Here you see an example where we've used base editing to turn off a gene linked to liver disease. On the left is a section of a liver from an untreated mouse with the brown color indicating antibody stating of the protein. On the right is a section of a liver from a mouse treated with the base editor. You can see that the brown color is largely gone, that the protein has been almost entirely eliminated from the liver. Here's an example where we've used a mouse model of the most severe form of familial hypercholesterolemia, homozygous FH, where the LDL receptor is entirely absent. As with human patients, these mice have extremely high LDL cholesterol levels because they can't readily clear the LDL particles from the bloodstream. Here, we've used base editing to turn off the ANG-PTL3 gene in the liver. We observed a more than 50% reduction of triglycerides, as well as a more than 50% reduction of LDL cholesterol. On the left is plasma from an untreated mouse, with all the lipid content making the plasma almost opaque. On the right is plasma from a mouse just a couple of weeks after receiving the base editing treatment. The plasma is entirely cleaned up. Here's an important point. Because we've made a stable change in the DNA, in the genome, the effect is essentially permanent. We've observed lipid reductions lasting for the lifetimes of the treated mice. Now imagine doing this in a patient with severe familial hypercholesterolemia. Mice are one thing, humans are another thing altogether. To translate this work to the clinic, say Katharacin and I and a few of our colleagues co-founded Verve Therapeutics, where we've been working to extend gene editing to non-human primates, to monkeys, as a bridge towards clinical trials. Here's work publicly presented by Verve. In the second of two monkey studies, base editing of ANG-PTL3 in the liver resulted in about a 95% reduction of the amount of ANG-PTL3 protein in the blood, which corresponded to about a 64% reduction of the blood triglyceride level two weeks after treatment. 
Here are the results for base editing of PCSK9 in non-human primates. In the second of two studies, there was an 89% reduction of the amount of PCSK9 protein in the blood, which corresponded to a 59% reduction in the blood LDL cholesterol level two weeks after treatment. Now, here are the results for base editing of PCSK9 in the same non-human primates, followed for six months after receiving the treatment. As you can see, the reductions in both the blood PCSK9 protein level and the LDL cholesterol level are durable, about 90% and 60% respectively, and will likely last for the lifetimes of the animals. Verve Therapeutics has announced that they hope to start human clinical trials in the next two years. If the therapy is proven to be effective and exquisitely safe in patients with familial hypercholesterolemia or with active coronary artery disease, one could contemplate the use of a gene editing therapy for primary prevention. Though not immunological in nature, it would conceptually be similar to a vaccination, a once-and-done shot offered to any young adult who wants it protecting against cardiovascular disease for the rest of the lifetime. It would be transformative and could have a large impact on the incidence of heart failure. And with that, I look forward to your questions. This is indeed an amazing form of therapy. Uh, have you had any problems with the primate experiments? No, so everything has gone very smoothly. Have done a number of non-human primate experiments, monkey experiments. The monkeys tolerate the treatment well. Um, as you saw on the last uh, data slide, the monkeys have been followed for more than six months now and appear to be entirely healthy, entirely stable, but their cholesterol level has been reduced permanently, more than 60%. So do you anticipate any problems? when you move to human trials? Hopefully not. Um, the, as I said, the monkeys are healthy. They don't seem to have any adverse consequences whatsoever from the therapy. It's a once and done therapy. So if you tolerate it, when you get the, the shot, or it's really more of an effusion of a lipid nanoparticle formulation, um, if you tolerate that well, then you should be set for the rest of your life. That's the hope. We'll see when we get to human clinical trials. Okay, questions from the panels? There is one question somebody, uh, Dr. Dandavani has asked, did you see any off-target effects? Yeah, so I, I didn't have the opportunity to, to talk about this in more detail given the time restriction, but when we've looked in human liver cells treated with the same treatment, the drug, that will eventually uh, go into human beings, into patients in clinical trials, we have not seen any evidence of off-target editing when we've looked at more than 100 potential off-target sites in the human genome. And uh, looks like it's very clean. Time will tell after we actually treat patients um, and evaluate what happens. Um, but uh, at least in the experiments we've done to date, we don't see any off-target editing. Thank you. Thank you for a wonderful talk. 